Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. May His peace fill your hearts. May you know His salvation that He has won for you. Amen. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to You for the life of Your Son, Christ Jesus, that He so willingly gave on our behalf. We pray that each and every day that we would recognize this sacrifice, this gift of Your grace for us. We pray that each and every day we would know the great debt that He paid, that our sins are forgiven. Lord, lead us too to forgive others as You have forgiven us. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Four seconds. Four seconds was all the time it took to change the lives of three families forever. Four seconds was the amount of time it took Eric Smallridge's car to collide with Megan Napier's and Lisa Dixon's car. It was a warm evening in Pensacola, Florida. It was May of 2002. Eric had gone to the beach with some of his friends. They had gone to have some drinks. Now, Eric was 24 years old, so this was perfectly legal. But what followed was not. When he climbed behind the wheel, he was impaired. In four seconds, he took two 20-year-old daughters' lives from their mothers. At his trial, Eric made excuses. He didn't want to be found guilty. He told the, told the court that they had cut him off. He felt no remorse. He was convicted and was given 11 years for each of the young ladies for DUI manslaughter. At the trial, he apologized, but his apology was superficial. No depth whatsoever to it. Renee Napier, the mother of Megan, one of the 20-year-old girls killed in the accident, she said that she forgave him, but she didn't mean it. In fact, she said later that she felt that he deserved what he got, that justice was served. He deserved to get those 22 years in prison for taking her daughter and the daughter of another mother, Mrs. Dixon. And don't you agree? Don't you agree that he got what he deserved. So often we do, don't we? We hear such a tragic story, and this is not a made-up story. If you look in the newspapers, you will find this family in Pensacola, Florida. You will find a mother who is hurting, who felt the pain of loss of a daughter. As you know, May is also Mother's Day. She said that Mother's Day, her four children, as she had hoped, would be with her, but one of them was in a coffin. Do you blame her for wanting him to get what he deserved? So often as I've read Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham was commanded to sacrifice Isaac, I, struggled with, I struggle with that text because I can't hardly imagine if I was called to in any way hurt Jacob. And maybe as you and parents and grandparents feel the same way. The very thought of that. But imagine for a moment if your daughter, your son, was taken from you. Not offered, but taken. Stolen away. At 20 years old, how much life did she still have ahead of her? Many of you have seen your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and some of you 60s, 70s, and 80s. Some of you 90s. There's a whole lot of time to follow. And Megan, she would never experience that. Justice, we probably feel, was served. That he got what he deserved. That Eric, feeling no remorse, got what he deserved. We, we like to see justice served, don't we? We like to see people get what they deserve. And not even on things as, as consequential as human life, but how often do we find ourselves in smaller things, things that are not nearly as important as a human life, finding ourselves wanting to get the person have that person get what they deserve. Maybe not our revenge, but at least that there would be justice served. How many of you have been betrayed by somebody? And you held that grudge. You held on to it. Someone lied about you. Someone hurt you. A family member disappointed you. How many times do we hold on to those things? Like Renee, we want justice to be served. We want someone who hurts us. Maybe not to be hurt the same way, but at least to know how bad they hurt us, don't we? We want justice to be served. But it's a funny thing, isn't it? Justice is a funny thing because in our world, it's so subjective. 
Just as seems and for many of us to come from where our heart is. What we feel is bad is bad and what we feel is good is good. There's not a lot of objectivity to it, it seems. Justice is such an interesting thing. 2,000 years ago, Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane. He went in and he went in to pray with his disciples. Remember Peter, James, and John, they knelt together. He wasn't leading a riot. He wasn't like Barabbas, a, a thief and a robber, an insurrectionist. He had done nothing wrong. Judas, a disciple, he betrayed him. Peter, another disciple, turned his back on him. In fact, it said that all the disciples fled. But he'd done nothing wrong. He gets brought before a trial, a false trial by the high priests. He's, be he's beaten. He's spat upon. He's mocked. The trial is a sham if at best. People come forward and they keep saying one thing after the next, but none of their stories corroborate because in the Old Testament you had to have two stories corroborate if you wanted to seek the death penalty. Finally, it was just in anger when Jesus said, I am the name of the Lord. Then, then He was crucified. He'd done nothing wrong. If ever there is a case of justice being miscarried, would it not be Christ? Would it not be Jesus? And what was His response? Did He shout, justice must be served? Did He call on His legions of angels? If we know the rest of the story, we know that in Luke's Gospel, He even repaired the servant Melchius whose ear was removed in the garden. No, from the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them were the words of Jesus. A prayer for those who had harmed Him. A prayer for those who had beat Him and spat on Him. Those who had rejected Him and turned their back on Him. Father, forgive them for those then who had, who had sent Him to the cross. For those of us now whose sins put Him on the cross. Father, forgive them. Justice was not served. But forgiveness was given. Seems like we celebrate our justice system. Leaving very little room for forgiveness. Leaving very little room for us to say those words, I forgive you to someone else. In fact, sometimes we treat forgiveness as if it's a weakness. As if someone who cannot stand up for themselves, a doormat might say, I forgive you because, well, they just don't want to keep fighting. They're more a lover than a fighter. Jesus shows that Forgiveness is a strength. That it takes such deep strength and energy instead of calling for justice to say those words, I forgive you. Peter said in our epistle for this morning, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Can you imagine that? Someone hurts you. Someone causes you pain. Peter says, bless them. More often than not, we want revenge. We want to repay evil for evil. We want someone to get their up and comings. But there's a problem with revenge. I'm sure many of you know this. At the time, it might feel good. It might feel like you're vindicated. I know some of you have sought revenge and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Initially, it feels like you feel stronger and feel emboldened. But over time, when you seek revenge instead of seeking forgiveness, your heart gets hardened. Your words, and when you say, I forgive you to someone else, they become empty lip service. They mean nothing because you have formed a barrier. The longer you hold on to that anger, the longer you hold on to it, the more it develops a barrier, not only between you and others, but between you and God. And why does it build a barrier between you and God? Not because you're angry at God, although sometimes you are, but because you are not receiving His forgiveness fully. Oh, He's offering it fully. He never stops offering that gift. But when we can't forgive, do we truly appreciate what God is giving us? When we hold on to anger, are we truly recognizing how great a debt He has forgiven us? He is always there. Forgiving our trespasses, not as we forgive others, but even in a greater way. But when we hold on to our revenge and hold on to our anger, are we indeed, are we indeed receiving that forgiveness? 
God gave us forgiveness even when we didn't deserve it. In Romans chapter 5, it says that Jesus, while we were yet sinners, gave us forgiveness. Instead of seeking vengeance, He gave His life for us. And we are truly accepted by our Father because He has forgiven us. Renee Napier, Megan's mother, it took her two years. But after two years, the Holy Spirit worked on her heart. The Holy Spirit worked on her life. And she was able to forgive Eric Smallridge. Not in the empty words that she said at the courthouse that day, but truly forgive him. Listen to her words. These are her very own words. I could hate him forever. And the world would tell me that I have a right to do that. But it's not going to do me any good. And it's not going to do him any good. I would grow old and bitter and angry and hateful. In my opinion, forgiveness is the only way to heal. Forgiveness is the only way to heal. After she spoke those words, she went to the judge and appealed that he might reduce the sentence of Eric Smallridge. He cut the sentence in half because the mother of the, one of the young ladies came forward. But he didn't start there. It started before that. Because Renee had good Christian friends. Renee had good Christian friends who when they saw the hurt and pain that she was in, they invited her to come with them to church. They knew that there was nothing else but God's Word that could bring them healing. And the Spirit started working. The Spirit worked through her friends who brought her to church. The Spirit worked through the Word that was proclaimed. The Spirit worked so she could bring forgiveness. Eric Smallridge in his time in prison, he realized what he had done. He felt pro pronounced guilt for what he'd done. And he sought forgiveness. And they came about. And reconciliation came about. But it was only by the work of the Holy Spirit. Many of us, we carry such great baggage that we struggle to even imagine forgiveness. We carry baggage of the betrayal of someone who has hurt us. And some of you, you carry baggage I cannot even fathom. You carry burdens that still burden your heart as if it was the first time whenever you think of them. But those burdens, that baggage, it's holding you back and weighing you down. It is keeping you from the full healing of our Savior Jesus Christ. Forgiveness brings about healing. When Jesus Christ went to the cross for us and He shed His precious blood, forgiveness brought about our healing. Not by what we had done, not even because we had asked for it, but because God loved us and He forgave us and He healed us by His precious blood. He healed our sin-stricken hearts and made us His own. Now, I don't know about you, but I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about your own hearts. I want you to reflect on maybe someone in your own life. Now, I've given you a real picture of forgiveness and Renee's forgiveness of Eric, but I want you to think of your own life. Is there someone who hurt you? Someone who's betrayed you? Disappointed you? Let you down? Maybe not just once, but over and over again. Bring it to the Lord. Not of your own power, of your own strength, because we can't do it of our own, but by the strength of the Spirit. Bring it to the Lord, because only in Him will there be healing. Healing between those of broken relationships here on this earth. Healing between us and God our Father. In Genesis chapter 22, God provided a way out for Abraham. He sent a ram to be in the thicket to take the place to be the sacrifice. But God sent His own Son to be our sacrifice. He willingly gave of His Son Jesus who bled and died on the cross for your sins. He willingly gave of His Son Jesus so that you might know the words of forgiveness and the hope of salvation. The hope and promise that comes from the cross. When we look to the cross, we know our sins are forgiven. Not as an Old Testament thing, something that happened in the past, but something that happens on a daily basis. Our sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven by Jesus Christ, your Savior. And our hope 
is not only at the cross, but it is what it points to. It points to the promise that Jesus has conquered sin, death, and the devil. And that as He has done so, we too shall conquer sin, death, and the devil. And we shall rise and know the full healing of being with our Lord and Savior in heaven. May the hope and peace of our Savior be with you now and always. Amen. Please pray with me. O Lord, we thank You that You have held no grudge against us. That You did not seek vengeance, although it would have been well due You. We thank You, O Lord, that instead You sought forgiveness by Your own precious sufferings and death. Lord, we thank You that even when we have turned our backs on You, when we have sought revenge, when we have sought anger, that You have sought peace and forgiveness. Lord, we pray that You would lead us, that You would be with us in our broken relationships. Lead us to forgive as You have forgiven us, to seek Your forgiveness and Your love, to show it to not only hoard it in our hearts, but to share it with others. Lord, we pray that as we begin this Passion Week, looking to the cross, that we would look also to the heavens to know the glory that You have risen, that You have conquered death. May this be our hope and promise. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.